She's a professor in the Department of African American Studies and the founding director of the Hip Hop Archive and Research Institute. Please welcome Professor Morgan. It is a great pleasure to be here and answer some of the questions that I am often asked about hip hop in general and the hip hop archive at Harvard in particular. I want to use this occasion to talk about this mainly because um, I am by training a linguistic anthropologist. I work a lot on uh, gender and race and uh, in the English speaking African diaspora. And no one ever wants to hear me talk about that. <laughs> they want to hear me talk about hip hop. So I want to address some of the questions I get asked all the time, but also in a way to get you to think about how you make decisions about what you're studying, what you want to do, and how you're going to apply it to your various kinds of ideas. So I want to start off, at, you know, something that's called Harvard Thinks Big, to say something that those of you who know something about hip hop already know. Hip hop thinks bigger. Hip hop always thinks big. And in many respects, there is this very, very close relationship I got into studying hip hop when I was doing my research on African American women in Mississippi. I decided to study women in particular because in sociolinguistics, and I was at the University of Pennsylvania, in sociolinguistics the study of African American English was mainly about young men young men in groups, young men alone, whether or not they were out in the streets, at home, but it was really focused on men. And the idea of the dialect of African American English was really based on male behavior. And the idea that women were not interesting in relation to that always bothered me. So I was absolutely determined to look at women. I was doing a study about Chicago and Mississippi. There's a migration between the to in terms of generational. I was very happily doing this and I thought I was doing incredibly important work. When I got to Mississippi in a rural area working with a number of women in that area, the first thing that I heard, and I just want to say as an aside, assistant professor at UCLA at the time. The first thing I heard was NWA on blast rural Mississippi. And when I you know, heard it, it was about six o'clock in the morning because somebody was working on their car all day long and the only thing that worked on the car was the radio. And I thought, okay, I left LA and I really made a point of never listening to NWA. And here I am in rural Mississippi learning every word of every song every piece of profanity, the NWA. And the problem with listening to music, of course, is that maybe the hundredth time you hear it, you actually know all the words. So I thought about it and I said, it's everywhere, okay. I'm talking to the women and the women said, we will work with you, we will be your respondents, informants, if you work with our children. And they were all young men. And all they wanted to do was talk about hip hop because I was from LA. That is what got me into studying hip hop. Not my general interest in hip hop, not my general interest in the fact that wordplay is so much important in hip hop, though it was clear that that's true. It was that my research plans were going to be completely upended if I didn't do what those women told me to do, which was work with their sons, and I couldn't work with them if I didn't know more about hip hop and understand hip hop. So part of the moral of this story is this notion of if I ruled the world, imagine that. It's the idea that what was happening at that particular moment was so momentous, so important to that age group that it would have been for someone like me and my discipline incredibly naive or short-sighted not to take a closer look. 
So my plans to study women exclusively were quickly upended and I started looking at hip hop in particular. How did I begin studying it? I'm a linguistic anthropologist um, by training, did a lot of work in sociolinguistics, and so I began to look for the theory that people are operating with. Look for ideology, look at system, look at membership. How do you know someone is actually part of hip hop as opposed to listening? And of course, I became very, very intrigued with this notion of the word, word up. People talking about words all the time, playing with words, driving people crazy with the various things that they were doing. So it became clear to me that hip hop itself was built on dreams and imagination. It imagined a world of equality and justice and fun. The world of MCs was based on science and laws of nature. I think some of us forget that in the beginning, MCs always talked about science. They talked about math and science. Why were they always talking about math and science? It's because they were in high school. That's what high school students do. They, math and science have rules without, with very few exceptions, especially in high school. And so the idea of hip hop having rules, having elements, having those things that we associate with school were very exciting in the beginning of hip hop's development. So a certain logic then begins to drive how students, young people who are participating in hip hop begin to think about it. And in the process, and I think this is why hip hop is still there, they also began to highlight and represent some of the issues that they were facing being in impoverished areas, being in schools where there were, you know, these days we call the term, use the term bullying, but where there were groups that you were in or you were out, you were um, not listened to by teachers, if you were different in any way that was seen as a deficit, et cetera, et cetera. So all these students are thinking about that and they begin talking about that, or as, Notorious Big said famously, dealing with stereotypes of a black male misunderstood. But the interesting part about it was that hip hop was always aspiring for a better world. And as Biggie says, and it's all good, and if you don't know, now you know. But the if you don't know why you, now you know part is the arrogance that's so important in hip hop. It's, it's the, oh, you didn't know that. It's like being in a class and you're thinking, I have everything down. And someone says, yeah, but do you know this? That is the essence of hip hop. And so many of you have participated in hip hop in ways of the best is this, you know. Right now it's Kendrick Lamar. Kendrick Lamar and the uh, Grammy um, incident in, in, in terms of should Macklemore, should it, it's an exciting moment of discussion about whether it's hip hop skills or race or America, and it goes on and on. So hip hop actually provides that for us. So I wasn't there in the Bronx when Kool Herc began his reign as the master DJ. I wasn't there when MCs became the leaders as opposed to the producers who started off, the DJs and the party DJs. And I wasn't there when African Babata started the Universal Zulu Nation. And I didn't participate in any of the regional first either. I didn't care about East Coast, West Coast, or anything like that. I didn't even wit witness the beginning of LA's underground scene. But my commitment to hip hop began like many who claim they grew up in hip hop culture. It turned out to be something that I simply had to do. So when hip hop began in universities, it was the 1990s. College students, many of them like you, began challenging the establishment and insisting that they begin to talk about a number of things going on in cities in particular that some of these artists were talking about. Um, and to begin to critique how we looked at young people in general, but also young people of color in particular. 
students, when I was teaching at US, uh, UCLA, when they would graduate, would give me all sorts of hip hop things. So I began collecting magazines, the Source magazine, for example, was the first hip hop magazine. And just to give you an example of the importance of colleges and universities, we know where the Source magazine started, and that was here at Harvard. So hip hop history begins here. Um, so one of the things that I want to talk about in particular is, and to end on, is to look at this notion of, if I rule the world, imagine what? And what we are, in fact, imagining um, in doing this. One of the things that we're talking about are these elements of hip hop. And hip hop has five elements. Many of them you know, it's the MC, DJ, uh, graffiti artist, dance, and the fifth element is knowledge. Um, and so the five sort of scholarly uh, elements, and if you look at any of the artists and their story, and I'm using Nas as the example because we now have a Nas Fellowship here, and it's the 20th anniversary of Illmatic. Um, one of the main points that he makes and all, all artists make is you must never stop dreaming. And never stop dreaming in an academic setting is always consider what you're really, really um, interested in. Don't give up on that. But that doesn't mean that your plan is always going to be the same plan. So it's, success is about work. So it is the dream, it is the work, it is the critique that you have to invite in order to be the best possible MC, the best possible scholar, the best possible researcher. And the notion of imagining and reaching the highest possible level. And many of you were here when Nas came to campus and um, that is, of course, him in front of the John Harvard statue. And finally, I think the thing to remember most of all is that Nas was right. I mean, he is a great poet, but he was right. The world is yours. The world is ours. And we are counting on you. And we're counting on hip hop, too, to make sure that that continues to happen. Thank you so much.